Good evening, everybody. Welcome. As part of the 34th Arkansas Spring Lecture Series in the Mathematical Sciences, I'm happy to introduce Professor Michael Lacey of the Georgia Institute of Technology, who will speak tonight on the mathematics of, uh, guess what, Futura. Professor Lacey's research is informatic analysis. For his fundamental contribution to this area, he has received numerous awards, including the Salam Prize and the Guggenheim Fellowship. At the 2002 Arkansas Spring Lecture Series in Mathematics, he gave a delightful public lecture on the subject of cryptography, card tricks, and kangaroos. Since then, his young son has become a teenager and he has introduced his father to the joys of Futurama. The rest is history. This lecture would have not been possible without the generous support of the National Science Foundation, the Fulbright College of Arts and Sciences, the University of Arkansas Graduate School, and the Department of Mathematics. Without further ado, let us please welcome our speaker. Thank you. Is this mic working for the public hall? Okay, very good. It's a pleasure to be here on, uh, again and to give a second public lecture. And most of you probably know what Futurama is in case you don't. It's uh, a comedy series animated cartoon series. It ran for one full season before being uh, cut by Fox and in the, in the intervening period, I think that was 2004 approximately, in the intervening years they've still released different editions uh, of, of the show as shows on Comedy Central. They have straight to DVD movies and is all driven by the fact that the, the series was a lot of fun, especially uh, and, the, and the part that I'm going to emphasize is that it had all kinds of different science jokes, especially mathematics, embedded in, in it in, in ways that could easily slip by a casual viewer. This show, this, the series is definitely a lowbrow series. And the comedy is very crass and um, lowbrow, but embedded in the middle is uh, sometimes very quickly is mathematics. So what is the mathematics of Futurama? Uh, I've got a little video clip to just sort of introduce this. <laughs> so the joke here is that the professor uh, is, always, uh, is always saying uh, that there's good news, and the good news is frequently that his team of uh, astronauts is being sent off on a deadly mission. And so the joke here is that the deadly mission is attending a scientific conference. Um, the Futurama characters in include Fry, Philip J. Fry, who is the one that uh, fell into a cyogenic machine and woke up a thousand years later, the time uh, of the series is the year 3000. Leela is the alien, a very, uh, Philip J. Fry is warm and amiable and more or less incompetent person. Leela is the, uh, the alien, the one that sort of brings, the, brings action to its close. The quote, all right, if everyone's finished being stupid is kind of typical. And here's a little interaction between the two of them that shows the characters of both, but also inserts um, a little bit of uh, scientific humor at the same time. Solve complex differential equations just like robots. <laughs> Bender is, is another, a third central character. Uh, he's a robot. Robots rules of orders is the joke here in this slide. Bender is uh, incredibly 
self-centered robot to the point of violent and criminal behavior. This happens on a uh, very regular basis, but he remains a very lovable character as well. Uh, and he refers to all humans as meat bags. Dr. Zoiberg is the, supposed to be a, a doctor for humans. In fact, he's some sort of crustacean and uh, uh, takes license as crustacean to act in all sorts of gross ways. He's also a frequent foil for Jewish humor, as this quote indicates, good evening, ladies and germs. Um, and then, of course, there's Professor Farnsworth, who we've already seen, announcing good news for everyone. He is the uh, relative, the last relative of Philip J. Fry, uh, a sort of dense and uh, uh, airheaded person, uh, also a little more than self-centered. So as the episodes go through, you'll frequently find little things like this, historic square root of 66, which just goes by in a flash. Um, old Fortran malt liquor, a favorite drink of Bender, uh, the alcoholic robot. So, and the joke here is, he's a robot. Fortran is a computer language, but not only is it a computer language, it was it is by this point a rather antiquated, old and out of favor uh, computer programming language. This is, of course, even more simple, basic, basic code for home sweet home. We also have the fundamentals of religion and basic. <laughs> Uh, again, these, these things, you, sometimes you have to back things up and go through them in order to get these screen captures. Um, Pyth Avenue. Uh, of course, pi is the important number that relates the circumference of a circle to its radius. Um, pi in one oil. And so what is the joke here is sort of there is, in case you don't know, a three in one oil, and pi is 3.172, uh, very crudely it's three. <laughs> the Fields Medal, this is actually, this is of course not a screen capture from Futurama, uh, it's the picture of the Fields Medal. The Fields Medal is sometimes described as mathematics Nobel Prize. It's not quite a Nobel Prize either. It's, a, it's an award given to uh, mathematicians uh, approximately four every four years. And there's a rule that the recipients have to be uh, under the age of 40. And unlike the Nobel Prize, there, you can only get one. There's a very select group of Nobel Prize winners that have gotten two, and an even more select that have gotten three, I believe. No, Fields Medal is exactly one. And so the, in, a, in a recent DVD, uh, Futurama was playing on exactly, on a reference to the Fields Medal, but also in the midst of this little clip I'm gonna play just now, is referencing um, graduate student anxiety. Of course, there's a few graduate students here, more undergraduates, but uh, you know, as undergraduates, you're anxious about being graded and whatnot. As graduate students, you're anxious about what your professor is going to write about you after you finish your degree, and they make a play on this as well. So you see what they're, they're, they're throwing in these, refer these scientific references, some of which, you know, are, I mean, uh, you wouldn't even catch unless you knew something, at least a little bit about the Fields Medal. 
but they still make it very funny as you go along. Uh, did you catch this? In this scene, Professor Farnsworth is feuding with another professor. And, and you, did you catch the Farnsworth yells down, your team sucks bosons. Bosons are an elementary particle of physics. So they sort of wrap in several scientific jokes in this one little piece. Um, uh, the reference to uh, Far when Farnsworth says, my team uh, is more is three times as expendable. Well, that's that's a ref that's a reference to the context of the the series where Farnsworth is always treating his team as completely expendable, sending them off on impossible missions. So let me just play this again. Also, uh, another feature of the show that makes it very enjoyable to watch is they have these brilliant geometric images all the time. Here is, in case you can't read it, it says Fulcrum County Prism <laughs> for concerned scientists, <laughs> which is a nice elaborate joke. And then besides just putting the joke on, 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 the, on the sign here, they have, they've drawn the prism as, as partially see-through so that you can see that it is a prism and, and uh, uh, look at the, the, the geometric shapes on top. Madison Cube Garden uh, is a venue that's used for different activities uh, in, in, in the series. It also has, uh, besides being an obvi the obvious reference to Madison Square Garden, they've cut the, the cube in such a way that it's actually a perfect uh, hexagon. Whoops, what did I do? Well... I am not sure what happened. It's not, it's, no, it's, yes, yes. Okay, good. Complex differential equations. Okay. So, the, so they've cut, they've taken this cube and they've cut it so that you have a, a hexagon on the, on the diagonal. And if you look at the next, if you look at one of the corners of the cube up here, you'll see that it exactly appears in the next scene in, in this series. And so they've actually taken a great deal of care in the design of not only the Madison Cube Garden, but all of the, the uh, geometric figures that come in. And uh, it, that's actually a great pleasure to watch. Bender's serial number. This particular screen capture is from a, one of the episodes in which Bender receives a Christmas card from his mother, his mother is the machine that manufactured him, and, it, and, the car, and Bender opens up the card and it says, Merry Xmas, son, number 1729. Well, 1729, um, again, this is the sort of thing that if you don't know a little bit of mathematics, a little bit of its culture, this reference would completely escape you. 1729 is a famous number that came up in an interaction between two celebrated mathematicians from the early parts of the 1900s, G.H. Hardy on the left, as the distinguished mathematician in Britain, 
And Ramanujan, on the right, was a spectacular mathematical talent, an untutored person in India who uh, had extraordinary insight into number theory. And in fact, he, he was writing letters to professors in Britain filled with the things that he said he could prove. Most people dismissed the letters as crankish because they looked something like this. G. H. Hardy was, had the genius to actually sit down and try to check some of the assertions that Hardy had mailed, that Ramanujan had mailed to him, recognized that some of them were indeed correct and brought Ramanujan to Britain. There they had a short but vibrant collaboration uh, in which, uh, and Ramanujan wound up being sick in hospital. Hardy was coming to visit him. He took taxi to the hospital and he walks into Ramanujan's room and says, the taxi that I just took had a, was, had a completely boring number. The number, its number was 1729. And Ramanujan responds more or less instantly that no, in fact, it is a quite interesting number. 1729 is the sum of two cubes. It's one cubed plus 12 cubed. But not only that, it's the sum of two cubes in two different ways. And it's the 19 cubed plus 10 cubed. So it's certainly a, a, an indication of Ramanujan's brilliance that he recognized more or less this more or less instantly and probably knew it in advance. But it's, in fact, it's a little hard to find uninteresting numbers. So this is what Ramanujan knew, knew more or less instantly, and uh, the, the writers for Futurama uh, know enough mathematics that they thought to insert this joke into the series. 1729 is a pseudo prime. Okay, that's pseudo prime. I mean, it looks like a prime. It behaves a bit like a prime relative to some tests. But it's not quite prime, does, but prime number. Prime number means it has no divisors except itself and one, as every number has, is divisible by one and itself. 1729 is divisible by the sum of its digits. So by that, I mean if you add one, seven, two, and nine, you'll get eight. Eight plus two is 10, 19, and now 19 divides 1729. But this property is also true base eight and base 16. So that if you take 1729 as integer and re-express it in, a, in base eight and add up the digits base eight, that's also divisor. The same for base 16, hexadecimal. Ramanujan's brilliant work was left, after his tragic death, was left to us with his notebooks filled with intense writing and the, the matter I just showed you. Some of these notebooks were even lost for decades, and it's only been in the last few years that mathematicians have actually recovered all the things that Ramanujan left us. His work was brilliant and complicated, and so when I found this article that said Ramanujan, this is article written for mathematicians, and it says Ramanujan for lowbrows. So I had to grab it and show it to you for this lecture, since lowbrow is, our, is the theme in part. Well, here's another, 1729 is sometimes called a taxicab number because of the way that it arose between Hardy and Ramanujan. Well, here's another taxicab number. You can't quite read it, but on the taxi 
is the num is the taxi has number eight seven five three nine three one nine. It's the sum of two positive cubes in three different ways. Which actually took effort for the, the producers and writers of Futurama to figure out. I mentioned the, uh, the nice geometry that takes place in, um, uh, in the Futurama. So we had uh, Fulcum County Prism. We had Madison Cube Garden. In one of the early episodes, they, ha they have a much more intricate example, which is based off of, uh, of this famous etching. Uh, this is an etching from MC, the Dutch graphic artist M.C. Escher, who was fascinated with, with drawing uh, the, the illusion of drawing impossible buildings on paper. So here, um, in this picture, you, it has different windows which seem to point up in completely different directions, but you, and you have people arranged in impossible ways through the different directions. It's, uh, and the stairs, you can climb, you can go up or down on both sides. So the notion of up and down is completely uh, different from the, what we expect. Well, in, in the episode I Roommate, this figure appears. And you see it's a very close copy of Escher's impossible building, except they've, so most of the stairs that appear here, the three the sort of three dominant ones and the one that occurs right here are in the previous slide, but then they've added some extra stairs in different corners. They seem to have some sort of stove at one level, a dining room, a bathroom uh, up, up there. So a huge number of different features. And then in this clip, they go through, uh, they, have, they animate it in a way that illustrates another aspect of the impossibility of this building uh, through Bender. Bender in this clip will fall down stairs. And, the, and then the, the cute thing is to watch what down means in the context of this building. <laughs> A nice joke there. And now Bender steps forward and he starts falling. Okay, so now he's continuing to fall down, but watch where he comes back up into the screen. So he, he, comes, he falls down here, but then wraps around over there. which is a beautiful illustration of uh, Escher's ideas that you can't get from the picture, his original picture. Wow, now this is fantastic. Hmm, I'm not sure we want to pay for a dimension we're not going to use. Wow, now this is fantastic. Um, the, the Goldbach conjecture is a famous conjecture in, in number theory. A, a lot of people outside of mathematics know it because it has a very simple statement. Every even integer greater than two can be written as the sum of two primes. This is completely unknown and, and we and we don't, we're not anywhere close to being able to answer such a question. It's, and it's, but it's very attractive and has been checked on computer up to uh, 10 to the 12 or something like that. 
Well, the Goldbach conjecture appears on the top line of this built this board, and it's followed by another by this this uh, script. Um, Futurama has two different alien languages in it, one more complicated than the other, and. Uh, and even from the very first episode, these alienese languages have appeared and have been decoded by the fans of Futurama. There's a lot of complicated things in here, and including um, other famous conjectures from number theory that we are a very long ways from solving. This, this particular scene takes place in heaven and uh, the two scientists are having a discussion about the Goldbach conjecture and uh, the pleasures of doing uh, research in mathematics in heaven. Here's another, uh, here's the Professor Farnsworth at a billboard, uh, at a blackboard again. Uh, on this, on the top line is uh, the first, on the right hand, if, if you ignore the last bits, is an actual formula from relativity. But in this particular episode, they, they need some sort of correction to the theory of relativity and they've added, thi and added this and that's what Professor Farnsworth is explaining. Down below is called some, what they refer to as the Greenwaldian theorem. And, it's, and it says something that doesn't seem right. As the one thing you might remember from your high school geometry is that a squared plus b squared is c squared. This is, that's what this shirt says. This is, it says Pythagorean theorem in Greek. Uh, it's not quite a right triangle as it should be. So the, the figure should be A, B, and C. And so the right triangle. And so the Greenwaldian theorem says a squared plus b squared is bigger than c squared. It looks completely wrong. It actually references a right triangle on a sphere. And so let's, we, we can actually verify that on a sphere, if you draw a right triangle, a, that a squared plus b squared is bigger than c squared. So I need a couple of volunteers. Here's one. Okay, so we're we're going to first of all we're going to um, make a right tri two sides of a right triangle in the sphere. Then we'll use this over here to mark um, what the right what the right triangle should be according to the Pythagorean theorem. So I'll hold this. You take the marker. Can we mark? Let's go to the equator. Where's the equ the equator? Is there? Okay, let's pull it tight. Now mark where the right on the equator. The same. The same. Uh, mark the string. I'll mark the string. Okay. No. Uh, Okay. Okay. Oh, mark on the string. Yeah, mark on the string. So we can do the link. Yeah, yeah I marked there. I marked the equator. Okay. Now let's make a. Let, now let's move right along the equator. Some distance. It doesn't matter. And just mark the string again. Uh, right across the string. Okay, so now take, now form, let's mark the third side of a right triangle. Why don't you use this board? Okay, here, I'll hold the top. 
And now make a right triangle. Is it? Okay, we need to, need you to, no, just drop the we, we need you to mark the string again. Okay, where was it? Right here. Okay. So um, so what we so what we did was we marked two sides of a right triangle on the sphere. And then we've marked the third side to form a right triangle up here on a flat surface. So now let's go back and see how, uh, in, in fact, um, Luca, let me, let me use your knife again. It'll be a little better. Okay, so now let's go back and not kick and recreate this right triangle on the ball. Okay, so we need to right. Okay, now move. Move along the equator, and does it match up? Almost. It's, no, it should be a little bit bigger. Right? Not because this is a little bit too short. Uh, uh, no, 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 no. Let's do it again. Okay. Over to here, and then yeah. Yeah. Cool. No, 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 no. I didn't do it. I didn't do a big enough triangle. Uh, that's close. That's very close. It's close. That's because I didn't do a big enough triangle. Oh well. Try it one more time. Okay. I think. I mean, that's because this is right here. It's not on the equator. There. Okay. This is not in the right place. This this should be way over here. Okay. And this goes there. Okay. <laughs> Over here. Okay. Well, <laughs> a squared plus b squared is almost c squared if the triangle is small enough. <laughs> so I didn't make a big enough triangle to illustrate the principle. Well, this is the first time I've given the lecture, so I'm not going to correct it now. <laughs> so um, I hope that with these few examples, I hope you see that the. the there's a lot of intricate mathematics in these things that, that can be uncovered and enjoyed if, uh, by scientists. It adds extra enjoyment for sure. Um, where does all this come from? Well, uh, David X. Cohen is producer for the show. He's a BS in physics from Harvard and a master's in computer science from Berkeley. Ken Keeler is one of the writers. He's a PhD in applied mathematics, and he takes, uh, he was the one that added the joke about 1729 into the series. Ken Odenkirk is a PhD in inorganic chemistry. These are all, write, these are all people involved with the writing of the show. And Jeff Westerbook is PhD in computer science. He invented the alienese that appears in the show. Um, and all of these people show that there is truly life after graduate school. <laughs> Thank you for coming.